Good morning. We have reached the last chapter of John, and I'm sure a lot of you are kind of relieved for that. I, I don't know, man. I don't even know how long it's been. Anybody got tabs on that? It's been, I think, like six months at least. But uh, I, don't, I don't regret it. Um, it's, it's a good gospel, and the, the more I have... The more I've read it, the more I've studied it, the, the, it's just solidified itself as my, my favorite book uh, in, in all the Bible, obviously. That's just my opinion, but for, for me, it's just such, it's such a rich gospel theologically. And, you know, if you're like me, your favorite book has probably changed over time. Uh, it used to be 1 Corinthians. There was a brief time where it was 2 Thessalonians, and it was just bounced around a little bit. But the more I've read the Gospel of John, the more it has solidified itself as my favorite book. And, you know, it sounds a little basic because I know <laughs> maybe, maybe if you're like me when you're as a kid and <laughs> you're asked in class, what, what's your favorite book of the Bible? To say any of the Gospels was a little bit too straightforward, and you might have been made fun of in class if you just said one of the Gospels. Um, <laughs> but no, it is, it's my favorite at least. Uh, but before we jump into the 21st chapter... There is, or there, there's a one thing that I want to address. Um, there are some scholars who do not think the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John is original. Uh, they cite that it differs in style. <clears throat> they say that verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20 seem to be the natural conclusion of the Gospel, right? So those are really the main few reasons that some scholars would cite. There are obviously scholars who do think the gospel, uh, chapter 21 of this gospel, is original. They cite that there are no manuscripts that exclude the gospel. Again, manuscripts just being copies of the New Testament, the books of the New Testament. There are no existing manuscripts that exclude chapter 21. They suggest that chapter 21 is sort of like an epilogue. It ties in themes that we've seen in the gospel, loaves, fish, Jesus and his sheep, as well as love. Now, the, the, there's more to this debate, and I'm not going to belabor it too much, but in my opinion, if no existing manuscripts exclude chapter 21, I think that's more than enough reason to believe that this chapter is original to the gospel. I know I'm boring a lot of you right now. This is just, <laughs> this is just some interesting stuff to me. Sometimes I like to touch on scholarly debate that exists, just so you're at least aware of it. Just be aware that there are scholars who disagree on whether or not this is original. I think if no manuscripts exclude it, they all include it, then it's more than likely original. Not to mention theologically, what you're going to see is that chapter 21 ties to a lot of things that John has already written about. So, unlike last week where I preached a more straightforward three-point kind of sermon, this week I'm just going to approach the text more exegetically. We're going to walk through making some observations. Some observations are serious. Some observations are a bit funny. Um, you'll see what I mean. But chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After this, it's not in the slides. I'm just going to read through it, so just listen for now. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going to go fishing. Then they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the risen Lord. It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but out a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised to, from uh, the dead. So, you probably think, hey, I've heard this before, and you have heard this before. If you've read all the Gospels, we have a similar account in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And here's the thing, John 21 is pretty clearly a different occurrence. They are similar, but there are pretty distinct differences. And now, in the context of John, John chapter 20, we notice that Jesus, he appeared to the disciples twice. Twice. First time, he appeared to the ten, excluding Thomas. The second time, he appeared to all eleven. And now, and here, John chapter 21, he appears to some of the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias, that's just another name for the Sea of Galilee. All right, just for context. Galilee is more than likely where all the 11 disciples are from, more than likely where they're from. And interestingly enough, just some context, Judas seems to be the only one of the 12 who is not from Galilee. And he's called Judas Iscariot. Iscariot possibly means man from Kirioth. Kirioth was a city that was in Judea, so do what you want with that information. But it is interesting to me, at least, that the 11 that remain with Jesus seem to be from Galilee, while Judas was not from Galilee, but from Judea. Verse 2, I'm going to read that again. It says, Simon Peter, these are the disciples that were there. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Pause, that's the Nathaniel from early in the Gospel of John when he sees Jesus approaching and he's thinking to himself, surely nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And then Jesus says to them, uh, you know, I, I saw you under the fig tree. Then Nathaniel believes um, that that's this Nathaniel, and then the sons of Zebedee, verse 2, and two other disciples were together. Sons of Zebedee, those are James and John, and just to clarify, we have two Johns, right? There are two Johns uh, that are disciples, that are apostles. We have John, who's the son of Zebedee, and then we have John, who is the writer of this gospel, John, the writer of this gospel, is often referred to as the beloved disciple. So two different Johns. John, who is the son of Zebedee, and then John, who is the writer of the gospel. Just so you know, James and John, as we know, according to Luke chapter 5, they're partners with Peter and fishing. Right? This is kind of how they all got together, how they know each other. Again, being from Galilee, that was one of the main kind of jobs that they had. And as for the other two disciples, if you notice in verse 2, it says, the, uh, and two others of his disciples were together. Who are those disciples? Well, one, obviously, the writer of this gospel, John, who's referred to as the beloved disciple, we'll see later on in this account. The other is more than likely Andrew. Remembering, of course, Andrew is Peter's brother as well as a fisherman. You see that in Matthew chapter 4. So these are the seven disciples that are there when Jesus appears. Who knows how much time has passed from when he appeared to the 11 the second time? Not sure, but one thing we got to keep in mind, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that says, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, I can flip there. I don't have that in there. Acts chapter 1, verse 3 says, He presented himself alive, that is, Jesus, to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So, in the Gospel of John, Jesus appears to them three times. We have the first time to the ten, the second time to the eleven, and then the third time he appears to just seven at the Sea of Galilee. we got to keep in mind that this was more than likely, well, not more than likely, it wasn't the last time he appeared. Of course, there was the ascension in Acts. So, in the Gospel of John, this is not the last time he appears to them. This is just the last recorded time in the Gospel of John. That's the setting. Boring stuff, but let's continue. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So again, similar to Luke chapter 5, where they go out all night, all night are fishing, uh, catch nothing. Now, j just out of curiosity, I'm sure there are people here. Has anybody here ever done like an all night fishing kind of thing? Raise of hands. I'm not surprised, Eddie. Nor Robbie, I'm not surprised about that. Now, <laughs> have, how many fish did you catch at night? Out of curiosity, was it a good? Really? Sometimes very good. Sometimes. Interesting. Well, unlike you, uh, they didn't catch anything. 
<laughs> and now I, I've read before, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know fishing. Y'all know that I don't know fishing. But I, I've read before that they would go out at night at fishing to catch fish at night. That way they could sell them fresh in the morning. Maybe that's what they intend to do. Uh, maybe they go out at night to fish because they're just going back to what they know, right? <laughs> Jesus appeared to them. Jesus is now gone. He appears to them again. So they're like, what do we do? I guess they just go back to what they knew well, which was fishing. So they fish, maybe to sell some fish. We continue verse 4. It says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. I find it fitting if you keep the context of the Gospel of John in mind, I find it fitting that Jesus, he appears at daybreak, keeping in mind that Jesus is, of course, called light, right? described as light in the Gospel of John. And then similar again to Luke chapter 5, Jesus, he appears to them, or he comes in the morning to kind of correct, to fix their bad night of fishing. He then calls out to them, verse 5, it says, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. <laughs> we kind of missed the tone here. The tone in the Greek is like Jesus saying, you don't have any fish, do you? He, he's asking a question, but the question suggests an answer. He, he knows the answer, and he calls them children. And I'm not entirely sure what to make of this, why he calls them children. Perhaps this is just like a term of endearment. But consider this, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 12 just a possibility. Maybe, maybe there's something to this. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 12. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Of course, the Word being Jesus, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus is God. But to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So just, just ponder with me for a second. If Jesus is God, and people who receive him then have the right to become children of God. It's kind of, it's kind of weird and maybe a little bit paradoxical, but in the Gospel of John, it's like we are both children with Christ and children of Christ. If Jesus is God, we receive the right to become children of God. It's like we are both children with Christ and children of Christ. John chapter 20, verse 17. John chapter 20, verse 17. Again, what Jesus said to Mary Magdalene. Just the, the second half of the verse, he says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. So it's kind of a, a weird paradoxical teaching is that we're both children of him and with him. Uh, make of that what you will, but that's, that's what I'm getting from the text. Jesus responds in verse 6 here, chapter 21. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. Again, similar to Luke chapter 5, but in Luke chapter 5, it records that the nets were breaking. So much so that they had to put the fish in the two boats they had, and it caused the two boats to sink. So again, they're similar accounts, but there are distinct differences here. The, we're going to see that the nets were not breaking, and it was obviously quite a large catch, similar to Luke chapter 5, verses 7. Uh, hang on a second. No, let's back up. I'm going to read verse 6 again. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. Now they're not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Verse 7 and 8, the disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, the disciple he loved, that is John, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Uh, the, other disciple came, the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Now, this is what I meant when I said that there would be some more serious observations and then some not so serious observations. Peter was stripped. <laughs> now the word here for stripped can mean naked, southern naked, right? It can mean naked. But it also can just mean that he was in his skivvies, you know, it also can just mean he was in his underwear. I find it very unlikely, just personally, I find it very unlikely that Peter was <laughs> completely stripped. I find it unlikely that he was completely naked. You know, the disciples were close, but Surely not that close. Ain't no way you're going on a fishing trip naked with your fellow friend. That, that would just be weird. Either way, still a funny circumstance. He's, he's, 
Either way, if he, if he was naked or he just had his underwear on, we have Peter who makes sure he gets clothed. He jumps into the sea to go see Jesus. And then verse 8 seems to suggest that the others, they were not in the boat, so, but they come to the boat to help them drag it to land. And then verses 9 and 10 make this all the more funny to me. <laughs> it says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Right, so we have Peter. He jumps into the sea, <laughs> having to make sure that he's got clothes on. We got the other disciples struggling to bring the fish to land. And then here's Jesus already on land with a fire, cooked fish, and bread. <laughs> so again, to me, this is just so funny because, come on, Jesus, you could have told us that you already had a meal prepared. Like, why did you make us go through all this, telling us to cast the net on the right side, that we could call in all this fish and then struggle to bring it to shore? And then Peter's almost naked. He has to jump in the sea. And then, anybody else find this funny to me? Like, I don't know, man. That's, that's just funny. They get, they get the shore. He already has a meal ready, even though he gets in the catches all this fish. It's funny to me. Maybe it's not funny to y'all. Uh, verse 11, I'm going to continue. <laughs> so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Again, different than Luke chapter 5. The nets were torn in Luke chapter 5. Here, the nets were not torn. 153 large fish. Now, I know that a lot of you in here have experience of reeling in one large fish. Eddie, it took you, what, uh, 80 minutes to haul in a, what was it, 28-pounder? What was it? 28-pounder. It took him 80 minutes to haul in 20, a 28-pounder. So imagine what it would be to haul in 153 large fish in a net. Has anybody ever gone net fishing here? No. Oh, was that hard? Yes. Okay, there we go. We have confirmation. So they have 153. <laughs> they haul in these large fish. The net was not torn. What's the point of all these details? I think it's just illustrating that, hey, this is a miracle. All right? It's not a coincidence that Jesus shows up. It's not a coincidence that Jesus says, hey, cast your net on the right side. It's not a coincidence that they catch all these large fish. It's not a coincidence that the net was not torn. All of this demonstrates that this is, in fact, Jesus. This is Jesus. Verses 12 through 14. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This was specifically why I wanted to title this sermon, Commune with the Risen Lord. Now, obviously, this is not this is not communion in the exact same sense as they had the Lord's Supper, but this is communion. The Greek word koinonia for communion can be translated as fellowship, uh, just, just intimacy. Intimacy. I, I mentioned this before, that it, <laughs> and sometimes it's used in a, in a sexual context. The point being is that the word itself has to do with close, intimate connection. All right, so this is not <laughs> exactly like the, the Lord's Supper, but this is communion. This is intimate fellowship with the risen Lord. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand me, but communion was never meant, it was never meant to be exclusive to what we practice on Sunday. Communion was never meant to be exclusive to what we practice on Sunday. I'm thankful that we practice communion, the, the kind of communion we have every Sunday, but I understand that that's not the only time we have communion. It shouldn't be. Communion with Christ ought to be an every single day thing. Intimate connection with our Lord ought to be every single day. And I certainly hope, I certainly hope, and I think we've made progress and in, in growth in a lot of ways in this regards, but I certainly hope that we share this kind of intimacy outside of today. A communion does not have to, again, <laughs> communion does not mean that you have to gather together and take some juice, take some bread. That's, not, again, a communion is not exclusive to that. I think that's one thing we, we maybe misunderstand is that communion does not just mean gathering together, taking a cracker, taking some juice. Communion has more to do with than what we practice on Sunday. And I hope that we practice it more often. 
Again, not talking about the cracker and the juice. How can we have fellowship if it's just on Sunday? And so the disciples here, they, they have communion with the risen Lord. And this is significant for a number of reasons, but one reason is this is just more evidence of the risen Lord. Or they did not just see him. They did not just hear him. They did not just touch him. They sit down and have a meal with him. They share a meal. And when I read this text, when I read that he, he took the bread and gave it to him, this is absolutely a callback to the Lord's Supper as he was taking the bread and giving it to them and talking about, hey, I'm the bread of life. This is also a callback all the way to Jesus feeding the 5,000 where he takes the loaves and the fish and somehow everybody receives and is satisfied, I think ultimately pointing to the fact that Jesus is, is all satisfying. When we come to him, we believe in him, we, are all, we, are, we receive satisfaction. We don't need anything else when we come to the Lord. So what I'm trying to say is when we read John chapter 21, I know there are scholars who may not think that this is original, but there are so many ways in which this ties back to things we've already read in the Gospel of John. As I pointed out before, the Gospel of John is so interconnected. This is not just a standalone account. This calls back to the Lord's Supper. This calls back to the feeding of the 5,000. This calls back to so much of what Christ has taught concerning himself, what he's taught concerning communion. And so they have communion with the risen Lord. And even now, even though we do not see Jesus as they saw Jesus, we have communion with him. We have communion with him, not just today. Revelation 19, this is not in the slides. Revelation 19, the way Revelation depicts this kind of communion, I don't want you to get caught up too much in the imagery here, but it, it depicts a certain kind of communion. Revelation 19, verses 6 through 10. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Again, not getting caught up in too much of the details, but this, this imagery of the marriage supper that is to be celebrated when Jesus returns. And also Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, though it's kind of subtle, it's kind of implicit. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were... For the healing of the nations, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Just that imagery of the tree of life on either side of the river producing fruit forever. Or what kind of fruit tree produces fruit forever? that we know of. But the imagery is that, hey, when you're in the kingdom of God, the, the full presence of God, you are eternally provided for. You've got the tree of life providing fruit, food for eternity that you enjoy with him. And so I'm going to bring this out, I'll bring Revelation out, because it, it demonstrates, it depicts the, this eternal communion, really, that will have with him after he returns. Eternal satisfaction, eternal worship of him, e eternal presence with him. 
Right? And so I say this again, the disciples here in, in John chapter 21, they commune with the risen Lord, and currently we commune with him, and eventually we will commune with him for eternity face to face. So believe, receive, commune with the risen Lord.